So now we should probably talk about the actual um, main dress. Um, uh, and I want to be clear. I'm sorry. I didn't remember what I know it was a Myrna Jean Davis pattern. Oh, right this here. is the base. Um, so I, I draped, I did drape the bodice off on Laura over her, over her corset. Pull it back a little. Which what is the name of that pattern? Oh, it's it's just called Early Bustle Era Basic Bodice Pattern. Okay. Um, and and so, it wasn't a straight drape. I did do a muslin. Oh yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. So we 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 adapted it. We started with her muslin with her pattern, and then we adapted it to you mm -hmm. with a fitting. So I, I don't call that draping. That's fitting. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh. We really loved it. And the sleeves were from her, right? You, I didn't. Yeah. I so the only change, the on you. change in the sleeves was I basically took it off at the elbow level, mm -hmm. changed instead of, I, mean, I thought, well, maybe I want like a big roughly cuff, but then I did a cuff where I just took the fabric and pleated it to the width of the, of the bud of itself mm -hmm. and then let it fall. And I'll go get this so I can leave it at you. Um, So, so yeah, here we are. And yeah, the sleeve is, is cut. I think I ended up cut. I added some extra width to the bicep area. Mm -hmm. And then we did do, you advised me to do a little pleating at the back of the shoulder, yeah. mm -hmm. which I did do. And then there's also, there's a tiny tuck under the arm. And that's a specific technique that Marna recommends, right? Like we got that from Marna. You got it from Marna. It's not included in this pattern, but okay. maybe it was I think it's from her Lady of Leisure book where she points out that multiple dresses have this. And as someone with a very full arm and a narrow arm side, it, it's a really great technique. Yeah. And then there's your sleeve. Yeah. So then this is pleated to as closely match the um the pattern itself so that hopefully it looks good. Sometimes it kind of lays funny, but um but yeah, so I basically um, pleated it, the fabric as much as it would go, and then just matched it to the size of this. And then this is my, so I guess you could call it a semi pagoda sleeve. I'm not really sure what they would have considered it at the time, or just a deep cuff. And it's because when, when, uh, one of the wonderful things about Myrna's patterns is she often does give you like basically a reprint of a fashion plate from the time period. Um, so one of the ladies in one of the fashion plates that she that came with one of my patterns um, has a sleeve. It's not pleated in the same way, but you can see that it's kind of a gathered ruffle. So I wanted to I wanted to kind of bring that in. Um, and she says you don't have to that the back seam won't always match, but I realized in my fitting that I could get it to match. And so I, I just adjusted the pleats until it matched there. So that's kind of fun, fun little detail. Nice. Um, and yeah, so so it was it was almost, I mean, although again, you did help me with the fitting, but you were really quite impressed with how well it fit, even just right out of the packet. Like I not just how it fit, but I do want to compliment Marna Jean how some of the really um some of the drafting best practices that we learned from Kenneth King, um, that she's clearly aware of them and using them. So often in historic patterns, you'll see, especially if they've taken uh, patterns off of extant garments, you'll see, for example, on the shoulder um, seam on a bodice, they'll have those two lengths exactly the same in the back. Mm -hmm. um, one of them should be a little bit longer than the other one. Uh, and then the way that gets adjusted for when you sew it is that the back piece gets eased into the front piece, which has been stretched. And in a flat finished garment, you can't always tell that's what happened. Mm -hmm. But Marna Jean's pattern did have that little bit of extra ease in the back and a little bit of space for stretch in the front. So it, it, it means that the construction methods that were began in this era can be used to get a really nice snug fit in that seam. So stuff like that, I was just really impressed with her drafting. I was impressed with the quality of the pattern. And also, yeah, it start, it's pretty, because the difference between her patterns and some other patterns where you where they've got the look of the thing but they're using a modern draft it's also that you know bearing in mind people's buys are different 
but she's also drafted the front properly so that, yeah, we had to move darts and kind of play with it a little bit, but the fullness and where the bus should sit when you have the corset on was correct. And that's normally a really big, that's hard to fix if it's wrong, if you don't know what you're doing. And there's a point where you might, you end up basically redrafting the front. And so the level of change I'm used to having to do when something just looks right versus is correctly done, did not have to happen. And I want to be very clear that Mara Jean's pattern is, is now the first one I'd recommend for the era. Um, just because I was so impressed with those little drafting details like that. And then the fabric we chose is from Ensembles of the Past. Um, it is, I honestly chose it partly. I bought this fabric. I was gonna make this dress originally and I ended up giving this project to Laura because we changed how we were gonna do the, how we, what we were gonna do. Um, I thought it looked safe as a choice for the era. I bought it pretty early in my planning because I buy fabric when I have any excuse to do so. Um, to be fair, I'll be, I'll be clear. I just liked it, but then also I wanted it to have, while this is a really popular small check print for the era, I also wanted to hearken back to, uh, Polly's other ancestors who were, who were Scottish. And it turned out as we found again, ironically, as we looked more into the family, we found out there was actually a relatively famous Scottish person <laughs> who was her direct ancestor, which which I hadn't realized. We always had kind of had this general conglomeration in our head that yeah, there were Scots Irish people mixed in, um, and we and as a family, and this is pretty common among Cherokees, we didn't really talk about them that much. It was sort of like oh, you know, we're Cherokee, and here is the famous Cherokees related to, but then also yeah, there were some Scots Irish in there. And we didn't really explore it. And I remember once I was talking with um, a, a colleague who was the head of mental health services for Cherokee Nation at the time. This would have been in the late um, late 2000s. And as in the decade of the aughts. And I said, I wonder, and I was with, we were with a third party who was kind of curious. And he says to us, well, why don't you guys ever talk about your non, you're all clearly have mixed heritage why didn't you talk about your non-Cherokee ancestors? And I was like, oh, you know, we just, it just doesn't come up that much. It's kind of a level of amnesia, sort of like, honestly, many Americans have. But then he pointed out, he goes, well, especially if your white ancestors got here before statehood, a lot of them were sociopaths. <laughs> and I was like, not actually the case for us, but like, um, a lot of our Scottish, Irish, and English ancestors didn't like come here on purpose. <laughs> like, they had to come to the United States or to the colonies. And um, so it's just not, it's not this like uplifting immigrant story that a lot of people have who's Im who's Im who came in later waves of immigration, I guess is the point. Um, but we can explore that later. Uh, that's kind of a bigger question for the earlier eras. But we did want to we did want to mention that we picked a deliberately kind of Scottish looking to us again to our naive American eyes a Scottish looking garment I can't tell you it's so and so's plaid which was invented anyway largely but um, I actually want you to talk very quickly about um, that a little more while I go down the hall and, uh, and then I'll be right back all right so I'm going to talk about the skirts too so. Um... This came about kind of quickly because I, um, just like everything else in, in costuming, right? Like we don't always realize that we're going to have an event coming up. Um, so I finished the bodice and I didn't really know how long it was going to take me and I didn't have a timeline for it. But fortunately for me, um, I really like plaid. So I've been, I've been working with a lot of plaid, um, especially in the last two years, uh, two to three years. And so, you know, you could argue, well, maybe it was a little bit more challenging because of the plaid or maybe, you know, gosh, I mean, it's a different kind of garment than I've ever made before, but I've made, I've made other kinds of jackets and I've made other jackets in plaid. And so actually I was quite surprised at how it wasn't really that difficult for me to make it. It didn't take that long um, compared to what I was afraid <laughs> was going to happen. So I, I finished the bodice and then I, I kind of, you know, was just kind of goofing around one day and I discovered that the Minnesota Historical Society was going to have a reopening of the Alexander Ramsey House. Um, 
it had been closed since the start of the pandemic uh, to the public. And so it, it was really exciting and it was July 1st. And I was like, well, if I, if I hustle, um, that should be enough time to at least make a skirt um, because I have literally everything else that I really need uh, to pull off at least wearing this thing. And so I, I went to a, a book that I had just recently bought. It's called Making Victorian Costumes for Women. It's right here. And um, part, I, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. One of the things that attracted me about it was the this cover photo it was so gorgeous. Um, and I also, I love, I love, I, I, I actually borrowed it initially from the library and really liked how practical it was. Um, it does, it has the patterns on, uh, on grids. Um, and so if you're, you know, when you're ready to use it, uh, the, you, you basically translate from that grid to your actual grid that you're going to use. I didn't realize until I started trying to use it that it's in centimeters. Um, and I, I did realize I would need to size it up, but it's, you know, skirt's a fairly simple piece to size up. So I, I, I did it. I think, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to try to see if I can get it done. So I went ahead and, um, you know, traced out the pattern pieces uh, for the a very mild uh, trained skirt um, and, and made it. Um, and I, and I was really excited and I loved, I loved wearing it to the event. I had a great time. And the one piece, it was really funny because I was showing my, my wife who doesn't really know anything about this stuff, but she sees the pictures on my wall from, you know, Myrna's fashion plates. And she's, she's looking at the dress and she's looking at the, the, the picture and she's like, is there something, you know, I don't want to say it looks, it doesn't look bad, it looks really nice, but is there something, you know, missing? And I was like, yeah, I don't, I didn't have time to do an overskirt. And frankly, I was a little worried that I was completely out of fabric because by then, I was down to just, I, I think I had just under two yards of full yardage, and this is a 45 inch wide fabric. Um, and then, you know, my little stack of scraps, which I'd been keeping as I went. And so I was like, I, you know, A, I may not really have enough fabric to do a full overskirt, which I'd also never done before. Um, and then B, you know, the event is tomorrow, so I'm not, I'm not gonna try to do that today. So <laughs> yeah, I had, you know, just like everyone else, I had sewn the last We don't, we don't sew to, I do my best never to sew to deadlines. Like, <laughs> yeah. So, so even since, since wearing it at the event, I have, uh, I actually haven't put it on again yet, but I'll do it for this video. So I guess we'll see how it goes. Um, I, I did realize that I did want um, a waist, a waist stay, which I initially hadn't done. Um, and then I haven't decided yet. So this top button, I've got a lot going on here. So there's there's the little uh, cord from the piping that's kind of sticking down. Um, and so my buttonholer actually worked really, really well. And buttonholers were also, I think they were probably the first attachments uh, for sewing machines. Buttonhole worked great uh, for every buttonhole except for the very top one because there's just too much going on here. Um, and I realized I could have been really dainty and careful and trimmed back a lot more, but I I didn't. And so in the end, I ended up for just this one button. I just sewed the button on the front and then put a little hook and eye here. And then further, I ended up actually safety pinning this top button position in place. Um, and I still don't know. I haven't decided if I'm going to move the hook. I'll probably end up doing what almost everyone does and just safety pinning it every time because frankly this is the kind of area at least for me where even a five pound weight fluctuation changes where i want that front button to land yeah and we're and we're also pretty we're pretty hollow there and that though that course it gives you a pretty deep Mm -hmm. like a pretty intense shoulder to bust transition mm -hmm. so you've got like anything that's kind of up here towards your sternum is going to be not as snug mm -hmm. even if you end up doing a little bit of, of uh, you know upper shoulder padding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I think for this era you can get away without doing um one thing so, I, I mean fold, I fold the edge of the combination back yeah layer of fabric there but yeah, yeah. that gives you a little more a little more going on but yeah I mean honestly I don't think there's anything wrong with safety pens for yeah. that especially for that kind of tricky area also when you, you don't have a lady's maid to keep moving it for you yeah which also existed at the time they i think yeah, they were they did. 1850. Yeah. they were pretty early so so yeah so there's that um and i did make the skirt and i was really happy with how it looked um and how it wore and then uh this last week i um i thought well i'll just go ahead and see what i can do with my leftovers um and made the overskirt and the overskirt also came out of 
came out of this book. Um, and it is a very costume, it feels a little costumey in some ways, because the way it's constructed, I think is perhaps a bit unusual and that there isn't a side seam per se. There's kind of a front and a back and then you overlap them at the waistband. And it could be that there are extants that are like this and I just don't know about it, but I haven't seen a lot like that. And again, given more time or maybe a different reason to do it differently, um, I may take um, one of the patterns out of Jan Janet Arnold's, I think it's the second book. Again, has that one piece I referenced earlier where it's the three different bodices and the one skirt and overskirt piece. And what I really liked about the way they did that one was that they took three quarter inch tape and put buttonholes in the tape and then sewed buttons onto the underskirt. So instead of tying it up or pulling a channel up or whatever, it's buttoned on. So then when you go to launder the thing, you unbutton it. Or I guess you could argue if you're if you're driving somewhere or going somewhere, um, you know, it might be a little uncomfortable to really sit on this thing and maybe risk squishing it. So you might choose to either put it on once you get to your event or leave it untied until you get there. So um, I'd already, I already, I will film a little video of me actually tying this up. But the one thing I did do for the back is I underlined it in silk organza because I did feel this fabric is really comfortable to wear. It's fabulous, but I thought it would have a little more oomph if I underlined it and gave it a little bit more stiffness. Nice, yeah. And that fabric is, it's a, it's a quote, homespun style. Um, I would call it like a slightly slubby quilting cotton and it's weight, mm -hmm. which does mean it has a little bit of motion to it, which is nice. But yeah, for that kind of puff, you're not gonna get that. So that was clever. And then the front, um, I don't know how well this will show on camera, but I did have to piece the front. There's um, pieces, uh, seams right here and here um, and but I just kept the same rule that I would use for making drapery or curtains which is it's fine to have as many pieces of piecing as you like but they do, do have to be vertical lines because otherwise if you have a horizontal seam that's not going to lay quite the same way when when you especially when you expect the fabric to be able to like swag and flow and you there are, there are those two that you can see and then there are two more that you can't see which actually for fabric this narrow, there's no way you could have gotten an overskirt in all one piece. So there would have definitely been some sort of piecing on the outer edges. And you see this all the time in Extanza. It's just like, it's just the fabric was just too narrow. You couldn't have one big piece of fabric that did it. And when you're cutting, if, if, you're, if you're running short on fabric or if you wanna be really careful about your fabric, um, you can even, if you're really desperate, cut your main pattern piece and then take the little off cut from the top and just flip it down and put it on your outer edge and that's how you get you know enough width out of you know one little short piece of fabric so so overall piecing, piecing is period it's something you see all the time yeah piecing is period so so overall i'm really i'm really really happy with it uh, this this book in particular i can definitely recommend especially if you're already comfortable working with um gridded diagrams but again remember that it's uh, it's in centimeters so for me you, you could choose to just work in metric, um, but I didn't want to do that. So I just sat with my little calculator and basically redrew diagrams of the total shapes and then calculated, you know, how many inches is in this and then added my my extra width to get bigger. Because I think that she um, is working for a 26 inch finished waist, which is too small for me. So I had to size those up quite a bit. Um, but again, the skirt piece is pretty straightforward. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy with it. And um, I think it's a really, really fun garment. Um, on my front piece, I did run out of the kind of heavier cotton sateen I was using throughout the piece. So I did uh, switch to this little uh, piece of, uh, what did I say it was poplin? Yeah, it's just a woven printed poplin. Uh, I don't think this would have been period, but I, I thought it was pretty and I, I kind of liked how the scale matched. And for my personal sewing journey, this was a this is a fabric I've had in my stash in various forms since 2016. Um, and I've made a pair of boxer shorts um, and a blouse and now this and now this. And then I'm using the last little bits to, oh my gosh, Lisa, I was reading um, Claire Schaefer. I was kind of messing with my, um, where's that book? 
I was messing with my buttonholer this week and it was giving me some some lip lip. So I was I was like, what do I do? And so I went and looked through this book about uh, interfacing and kind of offhand, she mentions that one of the best sewing interfacings in her opinion is just leftovers from when you make a blouse. Um, and I tested it because I'm using this kind of- um, So just blouse weight fabric, yeah. Yeah, I'm using this rayon. Well, and, and then also it's tightly woven. Yeah, so, no, that's a good point. Um, so I'm actually piecing the holy heck out of the last little scraps of this poplin to use as interfacing in a skirt that I'm making. <laughs> nice. <laughs> 